Yeah, this is a big man we got up here with us right now, let me tell you. And the reason that I have the privilege of being here and that we have the privilege of having him here is because the man sitting right over there, Trey Crable, got married in August of last year, and I had the privilege of officiating in that wedding, but his good buddy, Corey, came to pray and bring a word of blessing. And so here we are at that wedding, a uh, beautiful young lady that he married. Corey's there, but he, that night, I was wearing the mic, and I had to just kind of be the mic stand for Corey when he came up to speak. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, I had a new revelation of David and Goliath as we stood there that night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a moment, I'm telling you. I, I just, one question, just starting off. Did you ever hit anyone my size? Mm. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Did you feel bad about it? I just need to know if you got a conscience. <laughs> just a little bit. Oh, that's awesome. He knew what he signed hey, up for. I'm telling you. Hey, guys. How, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, amazing that we have you here. And, man, I have so loved getting to know you, Corey. Mm -hmm. I really have. And, you know, amazing things happen in your life. You're number one coming out of high school. 13 years, am I right about that, yes, in your NFL career? Most of you know that NFL stands for not for long, uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that the average player is two and a half, maybe three years of play, and uh, this man was there. He stayed 13 years in the NFL. How about that? Let's just let's give that up and talk about that. So, so we got Lions, Seahawks, Ravens, Cardinals, I mean, this man has been on the field with just about everybody that you've ever looked at, cheered, idolized, thought about. I mean, he's been there and he's hit them. <laughs> and uh, pretty amazing, it really is. So l let me just ask you, though, what is life like as a player in the NFL? Oh, I mean, help, help us. I mean, we, we watch this, we love this, we cheer this. But what is it like to be a player in the NFL? Well, everyone sees the Sunday glitz and glamour, right? And that's and it's awesome. We, we love to see people go out as a team concept and use their God-given abilities to make tackles and catch balls and, you know, do tremendous things to woo and wow the crowd. But when Sunday is over and Monday comes along, that's where the real NFL <laughs> starts. It's a very physical sport, very violent sport. If you play in it as long as I have, Monday mornings are not fun. Mm -hmm. Took a little while for me to get out of my bed, you know, from year eight to 2016. Um, struggled with pain, you know, struggled yeah. with, um, you know, trying to keep up with the young guys. That's a young guy sport. It's a young guy sport. And so I always have to just train my mind, retrain my body, so I can do it one more time. Just get through the week. Lord, yeah. just, just bless me to get through the day. And each day was like that. But, there is a lot of joy that comes out of that too. You know, you, you get a chance to go to different schools and different platforms and see different people. And, and through football, it gives me a gateway to talk to them and connect with them. Yes, I use football as a way to communicate, but I also sprinkle in some seeds of Christ in their life through those conversations. And so if it wasn't because of, fo if, if it was not for football, I wouldn't have had that opportunity to bless others. Do you miss it? I miss it every day. I miss yeah. it a lot. I just needed to hear you say that. I miss it a lot. It a lot. I miss yeah. it a lot. I'm watching game tape a couple weeks ago. I'm starting to get that itch. I want to hit somebody. I don't know. Man. I miss it. Let's go. <laughs> He's already said he hit somebody my size. I'm out of here, man. Shepard knows he leads the flock, so that's what I'm gonna do. So, so looking back, Corey, um, any any just and I know this is kind of one of those hard questions, but greatest moments. Any, any great moments that just you think about, man, that was, that was one of the best moments in my life, playing. And playing football. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I would have to say in college, uh, a, a game that sticks out of my mind is, you know, my junior year, we're playing against North Carolina, Julius Peppers, and very talented guy, and a talented North Carolina Tar Heels come to town. But that game, that, that day, we dedicated a game to a fallen brother. 
and his name is Cole Pittman, and uh, he died in a car wreck coming back for training camp that year. And so we dedicated that game to him, and it was just such a tremendous day of just emotion. He wore 44. The points 44 was on the board. We Ooh. put 44 points on the board. And we elected not to kick a field goal to make 45, just so we can have Cole number on the board. That meant a lot to me uh, playing football. Uh, it was more than just football in that moment. It's about life. It's about brotherhood. It's about family. And, it's, it's, and that's, what we, that's what we have in sports. It's just that camaraderie. It's incredible. Any regrets? Uh, any regrets? Um, you know, I, I could have played harder than, you know, some days. Uh, I, I could have practiced better some days. Um, I could have watched a little bit more tape some days. Um, you know, and those things add up. But I left it all on the field. You know, I played, at, you know, as hard as I could uh, with every ounce in me. And uh, so really, not much. Just, just, just wish I would have did a little bit more, you know? Well. You did a lot, and uh, and every one of us are amazed to see what you've done. Why don't we just pause and take a moment? People know you as a player. We're, we're seeing and hearing tonight this part of your life. But obviously, in this gathering with these men, one of the most important things I want them to hear and know is, when was the defining moment in your life when, as a man, you met Jesus Christ? I was born and raised in the church. My mother served on every board you could possibly think of in the church. She was an usher, she, was a, she, was a, she sung on the, uh, the tenor, she sung on the, the alto, she wasn't really a soprano, so she, you know, <laughs> we sung on the choir. We was at church Monday through Saturday, I mean, all the way through Sunday. So I was always in church. I used to sleep, pews like that, up in the, in the, uh, in the pulpit. And I used to sleep underneath the pew while my, while my mom is in the choir singing. I was a little child asleep up under there and until I was old enough to get in the choir and rock and sing. So the <laughs> word has always been in me. But I wanted to be like my friends. I wanted to be like the guys that I thought was cool in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Started hanging out with older guys. You know, I was 12 years old, hanging around men that was 24 years old, doing grown men things that I shouldn't have been doing. You know, smoking things I shouldn't have been smoking. Drinking things I shouldn't have been drinking. You know, messing with women at 12 years old I shouldn't have been messing with. But I, I wanted to live that, right? I went on through college and, you know, continued down that path of the world, knowing what was in me pulling on my heartstrings, yet I was running away from God, right? Um, I wanted to control my life, you know? And, and uh, yeah, some good things happened, but it wasn't always like that. Uh, I struggled and carry that on into the pros. Young, I'm married, I have a daughter, yet I'm still out two, three in the morning, four in the morning. Wow. My wife is asking me, what are you doing? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything that I think NFL guys are supposed to do. But then by my third year in the NFL, I got tired. I really got tired. I emotionally was drained, physically was drained, and I needed something. And I knew what that something was. I just needed to stop running away from God and just turn around and just say, Lord, I, I, I submit my life to you. I, I'm sorry, please forgive me, you know. And Lord and behold, when I made that 180, he was standing right there. Amen. He was standing right there waiting for me. So you know, that's, that's, no matter what you're going through in life, I went down that road. I've done those things. I thought those things were going to bring me happiness. It brought nothing but pain and misery. It, it brought long nights and very short days. You know, it brought a lot of headache to family members and friends. And I thought I was just doing this for me, but I was really just hurting myself. And when I turned that 180 and I saw Christ right there and I got on my knees in my apartment in Austin, I just said, Lord, I surrender. Everything I am, I belong to you. Less, I want to do this your way. And the day that happened, I just, everything has been taken off. You know, it's just been a great relationship. So what would you say, what areas of your life have been most affected by that commitment to Christ first, over the long haul? First and foremost, my better half, my marriage. wife, yeah. my marriage. Um, when I did that, I became a better husband. Mm. I became a better father. I listened more. I sympathized. I compromised. That was a hard word I had to <laughs> I mean, No, I'm doing it this way, you know? But I had to compromise, right? Um, I had to learn how to love my wife each and every day. That's 
picking up her cross and bearing it, right? I had to learn how to love my wife, and in doing so, bless me with 14 great years of marriage. I'm looking forward to year 15, which is in October 11. Fellas, you better not forget your anniversary to your wives now. <laughs> but when I did that, because when Christ is in you, Christ is love. So when I invited him back into my heart, the love was just pouring. Love was pouring into my community, into my family, into my friends, and into my kids, you know? And I wanted to give them what I didn't have, and that was a father in the home, which is tremendous, wow. which is huge. Well, I know you had a tremendous impact on Trey's life and just the whole process of uh, the journey toward marriage. So, Trey, would you like to just maybe ask yeah, him something about that or tell to. a little bit about that? Um, <clears throat> Corey was a, a tremendous mentor for me over the past probably 10 or 15 years, but um, there's been two instances, and I'm going to ask you about both of them up here, okay. where he's uh, stepped up and shepherded me in a, in a huge way. Um, and the most recent was, was through getting married. And... Um, I relied on Corey and so did Kath uh, tremendously for the advice and counsel and guidance that he's brought into his home because we've been able to watch you model that so well. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to ask you um, is to share a little bit with these guys about kind of how you told, you know, Kath and I what marriage is to start, how it, how it transpires as you go through, um, you know, and how that relates to raising your children too. Because I remember you, you were talking to me about football and you said a lot of people think marriage is you know, the, the touchdown, but it's the kickoff. Mm -hmm. It is. <clears throat> and, you know, it truly is. And <clears throat> Excuse me. When you take that woman's hand and you ask her to accept your last name, you're asking her to do a huge thing. She's leaving her family legacy to create a legacy with you. And so these are some of the things that I told Trey that I had to learn in my marriage that it's just a kickoff in the football game. And the game that you're playing, and, and, and the team you're playing against is Satan and his team. Because when you're in marriage, you are one. You said, I do, you cut the umbilical cord from your mom. Mom, I love you, I gotta go. But now my wife and I are one. When divorce happens and things happen, people think that I'm just gonna be better because I'm separated from this woman. But you're literally tearing yourself apart. So when you go through that, you hurt yourself more than the whole divorce. And so these are things that we talked about, you know, sitting on our couch and whenever you come into town for business. And I just had to paint that picture of football. You standing on the middle of the 50-yard line, you, you and your wife, an enemy and his, and his team. And you got to use the power of God and use Christ in your life and just march down the field, play after play. And sometimes you're going to get a 15-yard catch. You're going to get a 30-yard burst through the middle, but you're going to get tackled. Something's going to happen. Or life gets in the way and stress happens and you take a 15-yard loss. But that's when you get depressed and you get, you know, you get put down a little bit. But guess what? In life, in the football, you get another play. And when the play is over, the whistle's blowing, you got another play. And that's another day and another day and another day of God's grace. And so you use those days, you use those plays to say, I am a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I am the head and not the tail. I can do above and, and see me that anything that I can do or say because it's in his word. Like these are the things you say to the enemy when you play the game of football. And when you do that, Ah, it's a beautiful game to play. You, you, you appreciate the gains and you learn and love to respect the losses because it makes you that much better of a man moving forward until you score that touchdown. So it's just, those are some of the things we talk That's about. That's good. Thanks, bud. Yeah, yeah man. That's good. Well, I want to ask you a little bit about um, your family life growing up. I do know that it is public record that you mentioned that you've had, you had an absence of a father mm -hmm. in your home, uh, that that impacted who you were and the emotions that you carried in your life. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and how you um, have learned from that? Because you've had to go from not having a role model to trying to become a role model in your life and family. Tell us a little bit about that. God has blessed me with tremendous men in my life to, to show me what being a father is all about, what being a real man is all about. And it's not just, you know, taking women and loving on them and doing this and doing that, but it's really... It truly embodying the word stay and fully commit yourself and persevere through all situations. Um, my father left when I was three, saw him again probably when I was eight. 
Uh, didn't see him again until I was, you know, a, a junior senior in high school when my name was in papers across the country. And, and I remember all of the hurt and all of the pain that I felt as a, young, as a young kid growing up because all the games, I would come out of the locker room and I'll see my teammates with their fathers. And I will see my teammates with their dads at the award shows. And, and my mom is working and I'm sitting there with just by myself and get my certificate or my plaque and I go home, you know? And, and that hurt me. It really hurt me uh, to the point where I fought. I fought a lot. I fought in school. I fought my teachers, not physically, but just verbally and not just listening to them and being disrespectful. I fought all the time because I had so much rage in me because I needed that man in my life. Um, took it out onto the football field, which made me a great player. Little did they know that was my therapy session. <laughs> you know, that was, that was a time for me to just go out there and just unleash all the things that I had pent up in me. I saw my father's face on that kid's face across from me. I saw my father's face through that helmet in college. And, and those are the things that just motivated me. But then I realized I want to be better than him. How can I do that? I don't want to be like him. So I wanted to start becoming a father, reading to my kids, you know, date my daughter ever since she was born, you know, walk with my sons, teach them Deuteronomy 6, you know, when they wake up every morning, when they go to bed at night, when they're walking down the streets, I'm always talking to the Word, you know, just pouring life into them, building them up as men. You know, these are the things that set myself apart from the things that I lacked and the things that I wanted that my father didn't provide. And, you know, it, it, it really helped motivate me to be the kind of man I am today. That's good. Mm -hmm. So the wisdom of the word the really was what word. it was that Truly. helped to change things for yes, you. Sir. Wow, that's incredible. And I think you just said something really important that we heard in that first session, and that is stay. Yeah. Stay. Guys, stay with your kids. Stay with your family. That's important. Just another um, whole area here. The NFL um, has faced a lot of controversies, uh, in particular player persona about their treatment of women. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously that's been a, a major issue. What would you say as a man who we look at tonight as a man of God, what do men need to think about, about the way they treat women and the attitude that they bring to women? And what makes a man a, a real man and, and not just a, a hard man? Hmm. Well, I, I definitely, um you know, was that hit close to home to me. One of my teammates that went through that was Ray Rice. Great player, great locker room guy, you know, great leader on the field. Just made one bad mistake, you know, uh, and it cost him, it cost him a lot. But he learned from it, you know, he learned from it. And he realized that no matter what, you have to be big enough to, to, to walk away from that. Yeah. You, you have to set an example, you know, and I don't care what happened. You don't ever strike a woman. Right. You don't ever strike a woman. You don't ever strike a woman. You don't. You don't. You don't. When you are a follower of Christ and you love God, you love everyone. Now, sometimes, that, you know, that... It's called tough love, too. It's called tough <laughs> right. love, too. It's true. But in loving, you have to love them enough to say, I'm not going to get in this argument. Right. Men, we have to understand, you don't have to attend every argument you're invited to. When she come home, when she come home, or you come home, exactly and frustration's right. built up, and the kid's been crazy, and you've been sitting in traffic and all this stuff, and she says something, and you just want to, ah. nope, that's an invitation. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go to leave the room, guys. Do something that's just going to, you know, get you right because we are, they, they need us. They, you know, they, they want that strength, right? And when we, when, we, when we tear that down with our words or with our fists, it's hard to rebuild that up, guys. It's hard to rebuild it up. God loves her. He made her for you. Cherish that. You know, cherish that. Don't ever break it down with your words or your fists. And that's something that the guys in the NFL and guys across this world need to do. You know, we need to be bigger than, than what, you know, people say it's okay to do this and it's okay. No, it's not okay. When you live in the world, it's okay. But when you walk along with God, it's not okay. You got to live to a different creed, you know. Different and, standards. Yeah, life. different standards. That's and it. You can't do it. I love that, though. I, I want to be sure everybody gets that that you don't have to attend every argument you are invited to. Yeah. 
That's a really, really good word. <laughs> Thank you for saying that tonight. <laughs> I, I'm known for wanting to be right. <laughs> so I confess tonight. There we go. Yeah. Um, life after the NFL. You know, oh. you've, you've, you've had this amazing career. You've spent your life stacking up all these stats and all that's so incredible and it's obviously given you a phenomenal platform mm -hmm. so what are you doing with that platform now I know you're involved in in some speaking things and mm -hmm. and I know you have a charitable foundation mm -hmm. so just tell us a little bit about the life vision and opportunity God's given you right now in life I realize what I do um, is very unique and it's very special football is what I did is not who I am and and so I know who I am as a man, as a child of God, and as a father, and as a leader, so I know I have to lead and provide. I also know the stage that I was blessed with can either be used as the parable in the Bible where uh, three men got three different things, one got three, one got two, one got one, the one went in here because, my, you know, my, my father only has this one, so I'm going to bury it. Well, that one you buried was taken away from you. So I understood that parable to me was, I have a gift. And although I have maybe one or two or three, whatever it is, I have to make that multiply. So how do I do that? I gotta go out and, and talk to kids and, 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 and train them and, and give them seeds on their on they hearts and let God use that. So I created a foundation. I went back into the, in the neighborhoods and looked for kids that looked like me, was in the same situation as me, and trying to give them, you know, show them their hope. You know, this can be you, you know. Um, and then, and then I went into other communities and said, okay, since I've done that, I, I wanna go and bless others. You know, it's, it has opened so many doors. All of the accolades and all of the plaques and, and trophies, yeah, that's fine. But I find so much more joy in going out and touching people and reaching kids and, and telling them that you can be more than just football. You can be more than just basketball. You can go out and change folks' lives one person at a time by using the gifts God has placed in you. You have to find out what that gift is. Right. And, what, and when you find it, Build it up like in the weight room, right? You get strong, right? You get strong with lifting weights Right the only way to get stronger in your faith The only way to get stronger in your faith is to listen to faith word, you know faith music all the time you Got some muscles, you got some muscles, you know, so and that's what I try to tell people is you got to be engaged You got to be engaged with people and work out just getting that word and listen to songs and 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 go and find your talent and bless the world with your talent They need you and that's what I try to motivate well, and I think men need men in their lives, yeah. men who are different than the pack, men who call them out, who step up, men who really at times are abrasive but are always there to, uh, to pick them up. And I know one of the men that you've really impacted is Trey. Mm -hmm. And uh, Trey, I, I know just in some conversation we've had, you've shared, there have been seasons and times in life where it was Corey Redding who not only was there to help knock you down, there to help pick you up, make a difference, and uh, just yeah. uh, maybe tell them about that or, or let Corey tell them about it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I met Corey whenever he was in, in Baltimore, and he was doing well, and so was I, and, um, and you know, life happens, and, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, I'm living in Augusta, Church, uh, Augusta Georgia, um, sitting in one of those pews up there, um, really, really ashamed of myself in, in probably my darkest hour. Um, Portraying myself as, as a confident, got it all together man on the outside, but very, um, very sh ashamed and um, hopeless. You know, I don't know if anybody in here has ever felt that way, but um, it was the first time I'd ever crept into a church, and I, I didn't really know what to do. And um, as long as I knew Corey, <clears throat> you know, we've always called each other fam and brothers and see mm -hmm. baby, see baby, um, see baby. <laughs> if you know him, see baby. <laughs> But I, I finally just broke down, and, and actually it was because Corey called me, and he said, um, he's, like, he's like, fam, I can tell, you know, I, something's wrong, something's up. And, um, and I just broke down. It was the first time I'd ever, I'd ever really revealed that internal side of me, and since then I've tried to use it as a little bit of a platform for other people that might be suffering. But um, he walked me from that day probably until, well, still going on, mm -hmm. daily. Um, and shepherded me and, and throughout the entire time that Corey and I know each other he had been literally just in his sovereignty is so amazing but he was sowing seeds um, so that Corey could shepherd me out of a time in my darkest hour 
And so my question, if there's anybody in here that is going through something like that, um, number one, as, as a strong Christian man, how do you identify that person that might be hurting or that person that might be hopeless or suffering on the inside? Um, and then as the believer, you know, what, what do you do to shepherd that person through that process? <clears throat> the fastest way to identify is to open your mouth. You have to talk. Men have to be men and speak. You have to use your mouth, guys. We can't internalize things and hold things in. It creates a lot of pressure. And I've seen a man in my church who saw his mother pass, was one of the oldest sons in her family of like seven or eight kids, and he had to be strong for the mom. I got to be strong for the family. Can't do it. Can't do it. I'm not going to cry for my mom's funeral. Two months later, he had a stroke. Two, two years later, he died. And I saw that as a young kid, and I said, I, I, I got to talk, you know? It's, it's okay to cry. Jesus wept. It's the shortest verse in the Bible, but he wept. <laughs> That's right. You That's know? Right. So we have to open our mouth, and we have to talk to other men. Find somebody you can really trust, right? And not those guys that you say, oh, yeah, we boys, and you tell them something, and then, hey, man, you know what happened to so-and-so? <laughs> <laughs> that ain't gonna work guys that ain't gonna work man I mean we you know we got better bromances than we do romances man and we gotta you know we gotta you gotta have the romance that I have my brothers man is like I love you guys and I love you guys with the love of the Lord and there's nothing you can do about it and I dare you to try it <laughs> but that's the kind of love God has for me so I have to show that same love to him and listen listen with intent and then when you when you when you get to that place where you could talk and then you hear the pain in your brother's you know, heart and what's going on, then you pray about it. Ask the Lord to step in that conversation and discern through you to give the words to him. Truly, it wasn't my doing. Every time I talk to Trey, I've always prayed and said, Lord, I invite you into this conversation. I invite you into the telephone call. Before I push in, I want you to be in the middle of this phone line, right? Or whenever he came over to my house, we're sitting on the couch. I want you to sit right in the middle, Lord. We're going to sit. I'm going to sit right here. He's going to sit right there. I invite you. So come in and, and, and use me, Father. Let me decrease and let you increase so I can help this brother, help your son. And so when I did that, it just made the conversation easy. And whatever words came out, I can't even tell. I can't even recall. But I understood that he needed me in that time. I prayed and invited Christ to be in that conversation, and Christ worked it out. And that's just what it is. Men, we got to be men. We got to be real. We got to be bold enough to say, I am man. I am a man and I am strong, but I need help. You know, I do need other men to help me. You know, it's nothing soft about that. It's nothing soft about that. You know, it's, you know, men, you know, the guys that I've been around are bold. Ray Lewis, bold. I mean, just strong guys. Patrick Peterson, bold in the locker room. You know, these guys are mighty men on the field. Great warriors. And they're like that because they were just blessed with it. And when you have it and when you accept it and when you own up to it, it's easy to just go out and help others, right? But when you walk in boldness, when you walk with your shoulders back and your head, up high, your chest up high, you know. Everybody's, man, what is up with you, man? It's the God in me, man. It's that boldness with that, that fire in me. I got, I got the love of God in my heart, and I want to share it with you. And when you do that with your brothers, great relationships happen. That's good. Great relationships happen. That will continue to go on for years and years, because guess what? The things that came out of our conversations is placed in his heart. He, in return, is going to give that to his kids. And in return, is going to give that to his kids. So that's a generation of growth. That's a generation of love. That's a generation of helping, right? And that's what it's all about. That's, that's the wisdom of Proverbs. This iron sharpens, sharpens iron, so Proverbs one man seven. sharpens another. Yep. And uh, I think we're all sharpened by sitting in this place and hearing you share tonight. So I hate it, but we're down to the last minute or hey, two, two here. Two-minute warning. I know. We're into two minutes. <laughs> He knows what to do. Hey, guys, if you haven't been to YouTube and watched a little bit of Corey Redding in action, <laughs> if you just need to get pumped up, just go watch it. You need to watch him speak to the team. You need to watch him make some plays. I mean, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. It really is. Uh, it, it'll get you going, get you motivated. But these guys, all of us need the motivation to be men of character. Yes. There is a character crisis like no other time in our history with men. And so, Corey... 
final two minutes, just preach to us about what we need to do to be men. Mm. To, pre to, to be men of character. You know, what do we need to do that, that would change the future? through our lives, our families, our faith. First, you gotta speak it and say the devil is a liar and the truth ain't in him. And everything that he try to turn bad that God already ordained is good, you gotta get that out, you gotta get that out. Which, which means today's world, they try to soften men. Yeah. You, yeah. They don't put sex, male or female, on, on applications no more. They put right. gender, gender. Uh, you know, gender, right? right? So you, you, you have to know who you are. Walk in that, in that knowing of who you are and owning what your purpose is in life. Your purpose is to raise a generation of men that's God-fearing, a generation of women that's God-fearing. You need to be the, the knowers of your family. You need to, men, roll up your sleeves, build your ark, and put your family on those arcs. You need to put your family on the ark. You need to put your wife, your, your, your wives, your kids, your, 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 your in-laws, whether you like them or not, you put them on the ark. <laughs> You put your neighbors, you put your co-workers, your bosses, everybody. You put them on an ark, guys. It's about not getting to heaven and just, ah, man, I'm here in heaven, but you by yourself. You want to be in heaven with your loved ones, with your family, with your friends, right? And all the people who you touched in life, they're in heaven because of you. That means you did something great on earth, right? And last but not least, be a man of the towel. John 13, 1 through 17 said, Christ took off his towel, got on his feet, and washed his disciples' feet. That showed the greatest example on to serve. As men and as leaders of a household, we have to serve, period. I don't care what happened, you have to serve. You have to serve. You have to serve. You have to serve. Clock's just not long enough. <laughs> But buddy, yeah. you have delivered tonight, mm. and we just want you to know we love you. How about giving it up for mm. Corey Redding being here tonight, huh? Amen. Yeah. See that. Thank you, brother. Hey, man. Man, that was awesome. Yes,